And I'm excited to have Bill here from the Wood County Park District to talk about the Great Black Swamp. Thank you so much for doing this for us. You're welcome. Happy to be here. So good morning. Um, going to knock a little rust off of here. Uh, and been doing a lot of indoor programs uh, this summer. Uh, and have so therefore not a lot of PowerPoints, but doing a lot of outdoor programs. Uh, either in the heat that we've had a lot this summer or the rain that we've had a lot this summer. Uh, but both of those things, heat and rain, are pretty common in Northwest Ohio. Uh, and they've been common for over 9,000 years. And today we're learning about the Great Black Swamp. And most of us have probably heard about it. It's a huge swamp that covered a huge chunk of Northwest Ohio. And it was uh, a bar or in impediment to settlement in this part of the state. And the story of the swamp, I'll have to click it right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, the story of the swamp can be broken down into a bunch of different stories or periods of time. Uh, ignore the wrong date. I updated a different version of this um, and thought that this was the right version that I was using today. Uh, but I've broken it, broken it down into four stories today. And they're sort of timed it. And they're centered around what was going on in Northwest Ohio during this time. If you ever get the chance, there's a series of three books called The Stories of the Swamp. By Jim Jim Mollenkamp. Uh, you probably have to go to the library to find them. Uh, last time I tried to order them online, they weren't in print. You couldn't get them. I did hear that the Henry County Historic Society might have some of them for sale. I've not wandered across the river to go look for those yet. So, uh, real good stories. They're all pretty much first person accounts or immediate descendant accounts and covers a lot of the time period from the late 1700s all the way up to the 1930s or so about Northwest Ohio, about places that were inside the boundaries of the swamp. But we're going to start with story one. Story one begins a long time ago. Actually begins about 1.2 million years ago. But we're going to come a little bit more recent than that. Over the last 200,000 years, Northwest Ohio has been in a cycle of lots of glaciers and then warm periods. Lots of glaciers and then warm periods. And what you're seeing right here are glacial striations. They're little grooves in the bedrock. Now, I noticed, sir, that you're wearing a Kelly Island coat. Have you been to the glacial grooves on Kelly's Island? Yes. They are very impressive, aren't they? They're very impressive. Yeah. Yes. So we're talking about grooves in the bedrock of that island that are anywhere from 10 to about 18 inches deep that were carved by the glaciers moving across the island. These striations are a lot shallower, but you don't have to get on a boat to go see them. This particular set right here can be found at, at Blue Creek Conservation Area, the Toledo Metro Park in White House, Ohio. And this particular set is on the northeast corner of the quarry pond that was dug by the Toledo Lucas County Workhouse prison. It was a working farm and prison, minimum security. They raised hogs and chickens and row crops and processed them all on site. This is on, like I said, the northeast corner of the pond that those prisoners helped dig. And that's on Shadow Road, the southern end of the park. The northern end of the park, where they have the Anthony Wayne soccer field complex, also has some striations. And here's the weird thing. Those striations are in the overflow parking lot for the soccer field. So people actually park on it, which I don't know that I agree with that. Um, but these ones, the worst that's gonna happen is people walk on them, which is fine. So what caused 
the glaciers? Well, we go back 200,000 years ago, and it's the Laurentide ice sheet, which stretched all the way from the Arctic down into uh, Ohio and covered two thirds of our state. So what we're seeing here is the maximum extent of the glacier. And my pointer won't work well on the screen, but down here is Hocking Hill. That's part of Ohio that's unglaciated. It's the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, if we hadn't had a glacier, most of the eastern half of Ohio would look a lot like Hocking Hill. And our part of Ohio would be rolling hills like you see um, down in southwest Ohio and Kentucky. So think of the bluegrass country in Kentucky. That would probably be what we would look like if we hadn't been bulldozed over and over again by glaciers. So I think this coming up. Yeah, question. So are you saying the glaciers caused us to flatten out? Yes. So the glaciers basically acted like a gigantic bulldozer. And they repeatedly hit Northwest Ohio. They repeatedly hit um, the entire Great Lakes region, deepening the Great Lakes every time they moved through. Now, the glacier itself was at its thickest up north. And actually, somewhere up here, there's still a little chunk of the glacier left. It's only a few miles wide and about a mile north and south. That's all that remains of the Laurentide Ice Sheet. You can actually see it on Google Earth if you know where to look. I'm trying to commit this person. <laughs> um, so every time the glacier advanced, it scoured. And the reason it advanced is that more ice and snow accumulated on this part of the ice sheet. And that weight both pushes down, but ice isn't the strongest material, so it also pushes ice forward. So think of stacking up like sand on a sand castle. It'll stack up, but it'll also spread out. And that's what it did. So at its thickest up here, it actually depressed the crust of the earth. When it's a little bit thinner down here, it acted more as a bulldozer. It did press down a little bit. Um, the coast of Maine, the Upper Peninsula, the crust is still rebounding. It's still rising, even though the last glacier disappeared about 10,000 years ago. So the Earth is still rebounding from the weight of the glacier. And at its thickest overhead, you'd have about a mile worth of ice where we sit today. A lot of force. A lot of weight. Perfectly natural. Um, the glaciers come and go. We call the period of low temperature ice ages or glaciation. The periods of warmth in between are called interglacial. Technically, right now we are in an interglacial. 20,000 to 40,000 years from now, we should be entering a new ice age. I say should be. Uh, whether we do, it's unknown right now due to our effects uh, with the climate. It's natural. It actually makes temperate zones uh, in both North and South America more fertile because it scours away the used up soil and deposits new sediments and new parent material for soil to form that will be rich in nutrients. That's why our soils in, North, in the United States in the farm belt are so rich and productive. Whereas if you look at a place like the Amazon where the soil hasn't been altered, you know, hasn't been plowed away and new soil deposited, that soil is actually very poor. Once you clear the main forest off of it, you can get a two or three years of crops out of it and then you have to start adding massive inputs of fertilizer to make it work. So one thing that people tend to associate, associate ice ages with are the big fuzzy animals. And I'm sure some of you have seen or watched with your kids or grandkids the movie Ice Age. Mm -hmm. right, cartoon movie, Mammoth, saber tooth Cat, uh, the little squirrel always chasing the acorn and running into trouble. Uh, 
Um, we're talking about mammals that are over 97 pounds. That's what we consider Ice Age megafauna. They are very diverse. They're very large. And fossils of a lot of them can be found in Ohio. Not super common in the glaciated part of Ohio. They are found uh, more in the south, but we are going to talk about one exception where a bunch of fossils have been found. But we have mammoths, uh, the Columbia, Columbiana mammoth, uh, stood about 13 feet tall. It was about 30% bigger than a modern day African elephant. And to give you an idea of scale, there's a six foot man next to a fossilized skull that I found in the lab. These are big creatures. And the mammoths would have been here soonest out of the big herbivores. They specialize in eating grassy plants, which would have been the first ones to colonize once the glacier started melting. We also had giant beavers. So think of a modern day beaver, but scale it up to 300 pounds instead of a maximum of 75. There's evidence that they built lodges to have their young in and overwinter in. Uh, there's a little bit of evidence for dam building, but scientists think that they were more foragers in wet areas. So swamps and bogs and fence and things like that. The cool thing is that the first skull that was scientifically, scientifically described was from Ohio. So the species name of the giant beaver is Ohioan. So we get a little bit of credit there. Um, when you look at modern day animals, a lot of species names are Virginiana because a lot of the first scientists were looking at plants and animals in Virginia. So on the top left, we have the giant brown sloth that stood about 12 feet tall and was a, an herbivore, a plant eater. And to the right, you have the taper. The bottom left, you have uh, a zebra ancestor that was found in North America. And the bottom right was the stag moose. And to give you a little bit of scale, has anyone seen a moose in the wild? Okay. Well, moose, moose can run anywhere between 600 and 1,200 pounds. And their head can stand about 9 feet high. The stag moose ran between 800 and 1,800 pounds. It stood about 12 feet tall. Huge animal. And the, part of the reason we see such big animals is that big animals are more heat efficient. Remember, these guys are colonizing right next to a glacier. The climate's cold still. It's warming, but it's cold. Big bodies trap heat better than small bodies. So it is an advantage to be big. And you have all these soils that are being uncovered, and they're nutrient rich, and they're very productive. So there is a lot of food to be had as well to support these critters. And the giant musk ox and if you're a fan of yes if you're a fan of game of thrones the dire wolf there was an animal and it was named the dire wolf and it was named before the book existed okay dire wolves again what the sort of pattern we see is most of these animals are anywhere from 20 to 35 percent bigger than their modern day counterparts. This was a wolf that was about seven to eight foot long and weighed anywhere in the neighborhood of 120 to 200 pounds. Modern day wolves tend to top out about 140 to 150 pounds or seven months. So these are big animals, and the evidence is there that they were still pack animals like most canines that we see today. And then probably one of the most famous animals we learned as children, as children. Uh, what did you grow up calling? Favorite kids what? Tiger. They changed the name about 10 to 20 years ago. I don't know exactly when. They call the saber tooth cat now because mm -hmm. genetically it's more related to lions than tiger. Mm -hmm. So the proper common name was saber tooth cat. 
We're talking about an animal. Oh, I used to have a skull phone earlier. Talking about an animal with front canine teeth, you know, the long pointy ones. They're like anywhere from like six to ten inches long. And they look terrifying. But the fossil evidence tells us they were actually pretty delicate teeth. If they hit a significant part of bone when the animal is biting down, they would tend to break. Mm -hmm. So scientists think that this predator was a lie in wait predator. They'd lie in the bushes, lie in the vegetation, and wait for its prey to basically come right beside it and then lunge up from below to grab the neck. Where the only bone you have to worry about is your neck bone at the very back of your neck. It basically punctures any veins, arteries, and lymph nodes that it could get a hold of. Pretty cool, I am. And these are all things that we have either complete evidence for in Ohio or uh, indirect evidence that they were here from 10,000 to 14,000 years ago. What happened to them? Because we don't have to fight off saber tooth cats or dire wolves today, right? They're gone. And they're gone across the entire globe. There was a major extinction event. And there's no single definitive uh, theory of what happened to them. We have evidence of Neolithic people in North America. Native Americans uh, are, that were there, who were here at that time. There were tribes in Southern New York and New Jersey, 12 to, 12 to 14,000 years ago, that would have been hunting these animals. But these animals really died off about nine to 10,000 years ago. So they'd already coexisted with humans for thousands of years. What scientists think happened was that the warming that the Earth was going through to get to its inner glacial, to get to where it is today, caused a major melting event that actually changed the climate of at least the Northern Hemisphere for a few decades or even a few centuries. It's called the Younger Dry Age. And there's more evidence and more research being done today. Uh, one of the lead theories or ideas of why the Younger Dryas occurred was that there was this huge great glacial lake in Canada uh, covered in all of Alberta and part of uh, Saskatchewan. Almost two-thirds the size of the Gulf of Mexico mm -hmm. sitting on land. Glacial melt freshwater and it burst an ice dam and flooded into the Arctic Ocean. Fresh water is less dense than salt water, so it floats on top of it. And it would have made its way towards Greenland and towards the North Atlantic. And when it did that, it would have smothered the Gulf Current. It comes out of the Gulf of Mexico, goes around Florida, goes up the eastern seaboard, goes over towards Greenland, continues over towards Great Britain and Europe. And it's what keeps Europe warmer than it would be without it. If you ever look at a globe, an actual globe, follow a line of latitude from London over to North America, it puts you in North Dakota. Great, Great Britain's nowhere near as cold as North Dakota is, right? And that's because the Gulf current keeps it warm. It warms the air that goes over Europe. So if you smother that, you cover it over with cold, fresh water. You lose all that heat. It's trapped below. And that's what they think led to this period of cold weather after warm. And it was enough of a change to affect the vegetation. And you lose your plants. You've lost the base of your food source. And all this megafauna sort of follows along. It dies out too. So let's get to how the glaciers form the swamps. 
We have a glacier advancing into Ohio, bulldozing its way forward. And it bulldozes its way all the way down to Cincinnati. But we want to talk about what happened as it melts. When it melted, the edges of the glacier would have been loaded with sediment, rock, boulders, sand, gravel. And if you've ever shoveled a stone driveway in the winter <laughs> and push all the snow to the edge, when it melts in the spring, it'll pile of gravel there, don't you? <laughs> That's what it did. That's what this mine is. It's called a glacial end moraine. A fancy term for a pile of sediment left behind by a glacier. As it melted, the water, I turned the water, it's sitting on northwest Ohio. It's a lake. It's a glacial lake. And in this case, it's called Maumee One. And if you've ever fished on a lake, or walk out into the deeper part of any size lake. Near shore, it might be sandy, where the waves keep it agitated. As you walk out far enough, when you start stepping in, look, it doesn't feel great. And that's because silt, which is the next uh, smallest soil particle from sand, silt travels out a little ways, and when the water slows down, it falls to the bottom. Clay, which is microscopic, washes in from the rivers and creeks and it drifts and drifts and drifts and drifts and drifts for miles into the lake and finally over hours and days settles to the bottom. So what you find in the middle of the lake is going to be mostly clay sediment. How many people have gardened in northwest Ohio? Now some of you probably have gotten lucky and had some sandy or silty soil but a lot of us deal with a lot of clay soil. <laughs> so you have this clay being deposited everywhere where these glacial lakes are. Here's Maumee 3, and this is probably the most important one for us in uh, Northwest Ohio. Not the most important for Wood County, but remember the shape of this lake. They know the shape because what they find along the edges are beaches. It's the leftover beach of Glacial Lake Maumee. And to give you an idea of that, where you're sitting today, if you were here when this was Glacial Lake Maumee 3, you'd be under about 70 to 100 feet of water. Okay. Lake Whittlesea was a little bit smaller. We could see the leftover shoreline of Lake Maumee 3. Lake Warren is the single most important uh, source of sand in Wood County. Where you see the shoreline, right through here, these are most of the sand ridges through Wood County. If you've ever driven on Sand Ridge Road, this is built right on the side of the Lake Warren sand ridge. And this was Lake Erie 9,000 years ago. So fancy graphs talking about all the different levels of glacial Lake Erie right here. And it is also telling you how long ago and how deep. So you have four levels of Lake Maumee, you have Little Sea, you see Warren, it was not a long lived lake. So there's not a huge amount of sand deposited, um, but there is still sand. We have Lake Lundy was the last stage before modern Lake Erie. So if you hear any of these names, these are all um, names of Glacial Lake Erie. In the case of Whittlesea, Warren, Wayne, and Lundy, those are also names of scientists that finally figured out what the shoreline was. Okay. And that brings us to the story too. We're not talking much about people, but the rest of our stories are going to involve a lot of people. What we're left with is the Great Black Swamp. The glacier's gone, melted away, retreated into Canada. And you're left with the Great Black Swamp. And you see this outline here? Remember what glacial lake I said around the shoreline of? Warren, but the outline of glacial lake Maumee 3 mm -hmm. really informed 
what the great black swamp covers. Because the swamp is a lower area and it's characterized by very poor drainage. It's flat, poorly drained, and low. So over here, it's sort of a lineup of this. So we have the Fort Wayne Moraine, the Wabash Moraine. These were left back by the glacier melt. Remember the gravel melting out of the glacier. And then we have the Maumee Lake Plain. This area was the bottom of glacial lake here, where all the clay is deposited. Yeah. Didn't harp on it hard. Um, when we talk about why Northwest Ohio is so flat, it got bulldozed at least four times in the last 200,000 years. That she device just pushed everything south and left us flat as a paint. Okay. And most of us know we look at the farm field when it rains hard, the water just sits there. It doesn't run off. It has to soak in. It's very hard to soak into clay. So we have this bottom of lake bottom. Once the lake levels fall, we didn't talk about why they fell. The reason they fell is that a new outlet was uncovered once the glacier melted a little bit more. And it's a very famous place. It's a tourist place. It's the place where Lake Erie drains into Lake Ontario. Any guesses? Niagara Falls. So once Niagara Falls opens up, Lake Lundy disappears. We are near modern Lake Erie level. And we have this giant wetland left over, 140 miles long, going from Fort Wayne to Lake Erie, and on average about 40 miles wide. So from the mouth of the Maumee to Fort Clinton. Covered an area equivalent to Today's Everglades, covered an area equivalent to the state of Rhode Island. Huge swamp, huge, huge swamp. How many of you have visited the Great Black Swamp during your life? A little bit. It's been gone for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. We still see evidence of it. So you can't go to a swamp forest. That honestly replicates the Great Black Swamp anymore. Doesn't exist. So, just to give you an idea, here is Bowling Green. The orange, I'm sorry, the green bands are Lake Warren sediments left over, uh, sand sediments, I should say. Um, and you can see the other beach ridges left behind by the other Great Lake level, the glacial lake level. So you have Whittle Sea and Maumee too uh, that we also see. If you're a huge fan of the Oak Openings region, that's also a glacial Lake Warren thing. So the sand that you find here in Wood County at Rudolph Savannah, at Brander Preserve, uh, and where else, uh, Cricket Frog Cove, uh, I forget the, the last one. Uh, we have about four or five parks with this sand in it. It's the same sand that you find at the old open if you've done that. So we can we have the potential to have the same plant and animal communities that they see there that are so rare globally. So we sort of talked about this already. If you've been in a swamp or even if you've been in the wet woods in Northwest Ohio in the summer, you know it can be pretty miserable. Uh, I don't think anyone in here probably enjoys mosquito bites. <laughs> I know I don't, and mosquitoes certainly seem to love me. Uh, that was just one of the bothers in the swamp. So we just talked about this. The Oak Openings area also includes uh, Wood County, where you guys are today. So where does it get us? It gets us to some of the most productive soils in North America. We are part of the best bread basket of the world. And that's directly due to the glacier. And it's also due to the lake sediments left behind. Because once you drain the swamp and you provide tile underneath the soil, it's super productive farming. Yes. 
What is a moraine? So a moraine is basically the termination of the glacier. So the glacier has been advancing forward, bulldozing the land, picking up sediment. Once it stops advancing, it starts to melt. So if you think about snow shoveling a gravel driveway in the winter, when it all melts, where you piled up the snow, you found a bunch of gravel just lying on the ground. So that's what a moraine is. It's the end of the glacier advancing. <laughs> so, fancy maps for soil type. Um, here's Wood County. The blue in general is called the Huron Lake Erie Plain. It's all area that was underwater, underneath one of the glacial lakes. But we can sort of divide that further. Um, most of eastern Wood County are the Woodville Lake Plain reach. You're a Lake Erie fisherman in the spring. You fish on top of what are called reefs. And they're not coral reefs. They're just stony outcrops underwater. The eastern part of Wood County is very little with that. And where you have significant uh, reef complexes, you end up with your stone quarry. So, Lime City Road, where the Sawyer quarry is, uh, all along 20 there, and that stretch of eastern Perrysburg Township are stone quarries. Uh, out by Bradner, there's some stone quarries and uh, Stony Ridge, you know, quarries. So you have a lot of that. Um, 7.2, this little band right here, that's the sand plain. And you can see up here, West St. Lucas County, this is Oak Open. Okay, it's the same thing right here in Bowling Green, extending west The Henry County. So we have all the openings here. If you live anywhere in the dark blue, you, unless you live right next to the creek, you enjoy a lot of clay soil uh, at your property. So. so who lived here before us? The natives. Like I said, they would have been here as soon as the glaciers were seeded. This would have been a prime uh, hunting area for a lot of years. Once it warmed up, once the glaciers retreated into Canada and trees started to grow, you would have had a more complete ecosystem. And all of the research uh, done by archaeologists and anthropologists point to the area around the Great Black Swamp being a shared resource for many different tribes of uh, Native Americans. They would come here in the summer and build uh, bark wigwams on the edge of the swamp. And they'd hunt the prairies, they'd hunt the swamp, they'd raise crops out in the prairies, they'd fish and gather resources all summer long, and then typically move south to places with a less harsh winter, southern Ohio, Kentucky, and take all their, you know, take a lot of supplies with them. So we have natives sowing maize. We have a bucket full of fish heads and bones. Do we have any anglers in here? You have your own, you have your own garden. It's free fertilizer, very high in phosphorus. Uh, there are lots of walleyes buried in my vegetable garden uh, from the last two years, and it's been great fish. Uh, in the background, you have wigwams. If you notice, coming from the wigwams, you have smoke. There was no off or repel until about 100 years ago <laughs> to avoid the mosquitoes and biting flies and biting insects natives and the first settlers would have what are called smudge pots or smudge fires in their wigwam the whole idea behind them was to produce smoke which would help drive away the insects and bugs and other yeah We look at who is here in Northwest Ohio. Uh, there's two main cultures, the Iroquois from the east and the Algonquins from the south and west. Chances are it was mostly Algonquin historically. Once Europeans started coloni uh, colonizing North America, they wanted beaver pelts to send back to Europe. It was one of the first animal products exported back to Europe. 
uh, during colonization. The Iroquois were all for it. They're like, you give us guns, you give us jewelry, you give us liquor, we will trap beaver and bring them to you by hundreds and thousands. Beaver don't reproduce that fast. They very quickly ran out of beaver in New York and expanded into Pennsylvania and Ohio. And the Algonquin that were already there, like, excuse me, what? This, this is our ground. This is where we live. This is where we get our, our uh, sustenance. And there was a whole war over it called the Beaver War. <laughs> <laughs> and can you guess who the colonists back? The Iroquois. Right, the Iroquois pretty much won a whole bunch of new territory and they trapped the beaver out of it. And once the beaver were gone, they're like, Well, we don't need to travel hundreds of miles anymore, and they sort of gave it back up. Um, they were trapping beaver in Ohio, and French trappers were following the Iroquois. And some of the French trappers were some of the first Europeans in Ohio. So what was the swamp like, since we can't really visit it today? Think about massive trees. Think about, you know, a double layer canopy, you know, a layer of trees at 40 to 60 feet and another layer at 60 to 80 feet. And from some of the first settler accounts, in the summer, you could enter the swamp and in its thickest part, at noontime, it looked like sunset or sunrise. Mm -hmm. That's how dark it was. That's how well the leaves blocked the sun. Mm -hmm. It got the name Great Black Swamp from soldiers traveling it through it from southern Ohio to Detroit during the War of 1812. It got the name because of how dark it was, the dark water, the dark, mucky soil dark clouds of fighting and stinging insects, and from its reputation of a place where people enter and never come back out. That's how it got the name Great Black Swamp. It was about 90% swamp forest. About 10% of it was beautiful open prairie. <laughs> and this is where we find some of our earliest towns in the Great Black Swamp, are in the prairie. Because the prairies were a little bit higher. They either sat on stone ridges, sand ridges, or deposits of soil post Lake Erie that had been blown there. You're sitting in one of the first to be completely in the swamp that existed, which is Bowling Green. Historically, there's a prairie uh, running north south of Perrysburg, that's Hall Prairie. It now has Hall Prairie Road. There are also prairies extending to the southeast and southwest of Florida. What? What do you call something else? Prairie Depot. Prairie Depot. It used to be called Prairie Depot. Yes, Prairie Depot. <laughs> Today, we can get close approximations if you've been to Pearson Metro Park. Uh, if you've done parts of the Slippery Elm Trail near Rudolph, Ohio in the spring, you can see how wet it is. Um, but we've we've altered the hydrology, the, the water table uh, in the what used to be the swamp. That brings us to story three, where Europeans finally get a hold of the territory we live today. So here's a cute picture put out by the Division of Wildlife here in Ohio. It gives a little representation of what Ohio looks like at three different dates. This is 1803. What's special about 1803? is when Ohio became a state, officially, putting an end to the Michigan-Ohio War and starting the rivalry between Ohio and Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> pretty germane now that we're in the college football season. Yeah. <laughs> but we had a huge variety of wildlife. Everywhere that's a shade of green is forest. And this blue is swamp forest. That's the Great Black Swamp. Down here, we do have some prairies. And this is area that, if you're a little bit further south, you'd be in bluegrass country in, in Kentucky. Um, you have the right mix of sediments and topography for tall grass prairies. 
Um, there was a little bit along the Indiana border as well. And then we know in the Oak Opening region, we already talked about in Lake County that it's prairie. So it's not super precise. The trails you see here, those are Native American trails. You move through the state. Overall, the state of Ohio is 95% forest. It's said that a squirrel could hop from Indiana to Pennsylvania without ever touching the ground. <laughs> Or go from Cincinnati to Michigan during the same year. 95% forest, about 4% prairie, about 1% water. Yeah, I can rip and creep. We had elk here. We had gray wolf, bobcat, bison, otter, black bear, sturgeon. And I'll spell off the list down there. Uh, oh, turkey. So remember that map. Remember what, what it looks like. We look at the Great Black Swamp. There were two counties completely in the swamp, holding against the title, but it's 100% in the swamp. Wood County was the second map. The only part that wasn't swamp was right along the ridge, was basically the river bank of the Monty River, the block. So about half of Perry's River was pretty well drained as well. We look at one of the early maps of Ohio. This is from, oh, the date was on here. It's from about 1812. Uh, I don't see it. What we see here are the rivers of the state and some of the early towns. Uh, so we have Cincinnati down here, Chillicothe, Right here, Zanesville, um, from one of our other capitals, Marietta, right there. Up here, guess what? Let me find you a city. Uh, Cleveland, over here. Okay. Northwest Ohio, nothing. Just a wasteland. That was about the case. Here's some of the prairies we're talking about. Finally, I thought I had to slide in here. Um, we're looking at Bowling Green. You have Wilson Prairie, Williams Prairie. Um, down below, this is Wadsworth Prairie. Those are all the ones that are named down here. Holiday Prairie over here. Hall Prairie up by Perrysburg and Willow Prairie. So you can see we did have a prairie complex right around Bowling Green. Bowling Green was founded in 1832. Perrysburg was founded in 1816. Remember, half of this is on a river bluff. They didn't have to drain anything. And there's a river for transport. So they get a little head start. The Bowling Green is one of the next ones. The more beautiful prairie pictures. You can still find all of these flowers in some of the Wood County Park. Uh, the photo on the far right is from WW Night Preserve in Perrysburg. I'm not sure where the cardinal flower is. Um, the Joe Pye weed and tall iron weed that's also found uh, at Black Swamp Preserve right there in Bowling Green. You don't know where that is, it's on um, South Maple Street, which is accessed by uh, Drifty Lane, right south of the school. Uh, the, uh, oh, Montessori. Thank you. Thank you. The Montessori. <laughs> So that's just where the Slippery Island Trail begins. It goes all the way from Bowling Green to North Baltimore, 13 miles long. So, so fun things that we had in Ohio, and some of these aren't so fun. <laughs> um, we had mountain lions. They weren't called mountain lions in Ohio, except for Southeast Ohio. This cat actually has five different names that I know. Mountain lion. Anyone else have another name? Puma. Puma. Cougar. Panther. Last one, I'm not sure really where it comes from. It starts with a C. We also call catamount. Okay. Uh, solitary predator, apex predator, meaning it's the top of the food chain. Males can get up to 200 pounds. Okay. If you remember a few years back in Colorado, there's a guy jogging and he got attacked by a mountain lion and he ended up fighting it and he ended up strangling it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it tore him up. 
Yeah. It was a starving, roughly 58 pounds an hour. Oh, yeah. Trying to battle one in its prime in the 180 plus range, mm -hmm. you don't have a chance because you're doing it barehanded. Right? We have Martin living in Ohio. We have elk. We have fishers, black bear, bobcat, eastern woodland bison, porcupine, gray wolf. All of those are found in Ohio when Ohio becomes a state in 1803. Some of those animals are terrifying. Some of, some of those animals are a pest if you're raising your own animals, which a lot of people were in the 1800s. All of those animals that eat meat will take an easy meal like our dumb chicken stuff and cows and pigs. All right. What did the Great Black Swamp look like in these settlements? There were a lot of trees. And it was one of the first things to go. Trees go first. And once trees go, now you start digging ditches to move water. At first, it was chaotic. Someone would get a plot of land, clear it, drain it to the one adjacent. Someone buys that plot of land, they clear it, drain it, sometimes to an undeveloped parcel, sometimes back onto the first parcel, <laughs> angering the first person that was there. There were no rules, there were no laws, there was no plan for about 30 years. It was this sort of mayhem. Do what you want to make your land work for you. Some of the first trees taken out of the swamp were measured, and they were measured occasionally. Um, we have a rock solid account of a sycamore that was cut out of the swamp in Wood County. The circumference around the trunk was 45 feet. Oh, oh, yeah, we're talking massive trees that were hundreds of years old. A fair number of that wood amount of that wood was turned into um, boards for building houses. It was laid down onto roads to make plank roads. Sometimes whole logs were laid down to make corduroy roads, uh, especially in areas where the soil just kept absorbing the logs. They wouldn't even bother running them through the sawmill. They dropped the whole log on it. And they'd still have to do it yearly because the ground would just keep sucking up logs. Sometimes it's only 30 feet of logs. Uh, underneath the road surface. A fair amount of the wood was just burned. There was that volume of it. It couldn't be shipped out fast enough or it couldn't get access to roads or lakes that could carry it. Most of the timber cutting was done in the winter when the swamp was frozen. So farmers became foresters in the winter or lumberjacks, if you will. So what do, what do humans do when they have a problem? They, they, they solve it. They come up with a better machine. It's what has allowed us to live on every continent on this planet. This is the Buckeye Traction Ditcher. <laughs> All right, developed right here in good old Ohio. Uh, there is one on display at the uh, Hancock County Historic Center. Uh, it might be this exact one. Basically, you have a steam engine powering wheels with treads, so you have this big digging wheel behind it. It just spins and digs. It's a trencher. All it does is dig a thick and wide trench. You can dig it down to about three and a half feet. Get it under the frost line. What do you do with it? You take it into your cleared field and you start laying down tile. Tile is a drainage device. And the guy here at the back is standing down in the trench. All right? He's the poor soul that has to lay the pipe. Uh, some of these other guys are handing him pipe or dropping it in, and he busts it up to the next one. Um, I don't have a tile with me, but they're on average about 16 inches long. And they're made from, a lot of them are made from the clay that made up the swamp. And they are fired in furnaces from coal from Southeast Ohio. They were shipped up here to, fight, to run the kiln. At one point, there are over 200 clay tile kilns in Northwest Ohio. If you drive around today, uh, 
not hard to find a field that's being repiled using the black plastic pipe. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to do that about every 20 to 30 years because it clogs the sediment over time. In the area that was the Great Black Swamp, you know, that 140 by 40 mile wide area, there's enough tile of various types to reach from here to the moon. There's more tile per square mile under what used to be the Great Black Swamp than any other place on Earth. That's, part of, that's how you get rid of a swamp. Okay. So a lot of tile works all through Northwest Ohio. Some of you probably have family or some of you may have vis visited the tile works. There were still some running as recently as the 1930s and 40s before plastic really came out of the city. So once you start draining your field and drain them into ditches, the ditches were dug to carry the water as quickly as you could to either a river or to Lake Erie. And all this was done under the ditching laws passed after the Civil War. That's when Ohio finally got its act together and said, hey, you just can't willy-nilly drain on your neighbor. You have to drain into the ditch. They're going to dig along the road because the soil from the ditch is going to help raise the road to keep it from flooding. All right, it's going to let that road be dry. Once they start getting access to blasting and quarry technology, then they start letting stone on the road. Yeah. Is this about when they started digging canals as well? Yeah, so canals would have started uh, in the early 1800s. And there was a canal that ran from Cincinnati up to Toledo. Uh, which one was that? Erie Canal. Yeah. We had a canal that went up. It went north south. There was one that was going east west too. I don't remember that. One. That was the Erie. So Miami Canal goes north south. Uh, so yeah, uh, the canals get going. 1830s, I think. Uh, they met their death in about 19, 13 or 18 during the giant flood that Ohio had. Basically destroyed almost all the canal infrastructure in the state. And by that time, the railroads had already moved in and were decimating the, the canal. Because canal boats move four miles now. <laughs> they move at least 15, yeah. if not 30. Yeah. And trains can haul a lot more pounds uh, than a canal boat. So you dig your ditches to form your roads to carry water on. Farmers tie, run their tile to the ditches. You end up with this network that allows you to at least temporarily drain the swamp. It requires constant maintenance. You see the ditches in Wood County get redug or cleaned up every two to three years. Uh, we already talked about piles of place about every 20 to 30 years. We're only ever about 80 years from the swamp coming back if we stop all of our maintenance. So if you've ever watched the show Life After Humans or whatever, or whatever it's called on the History Channel, uh, Life After People, I think, uh, Great Black Swamp would start reestablishing itself as a marsh in about 80 years. Uh, part of what helped First settlement in Wood County was an oil boom in the 1800s. The oil was first found around Finley, and then they followed the oil bearing material northward all the way almost to Bowling, or, yeah, to Bowling Green. So through North Baltimore up to Bowling Green, you have oil being struck and basically uh, produced. So that led to some early development in Wood County. What does it mean for wildlife? All of those animals we talked about disappeared. We've cleared the forest. We've drained the swamp. The prairies were one of the first things to go because they're the easiest thing to sell. You know, it's where people's houses and farm fields went first. Once those are full, people start tackling the forest. So we lose all these animals. By 1903, Ohio looks like we've gone from 95% forest. To 17 percent in the course of 100 years. The forest strongholds are northeast Ohio, where it's just two different 
helps to really timber effectively and southeast Ohio for the same reason. Very difficult timbering. There was easier timber to be had further west. So that stuff sort of gets left behind. Um, the bison are gone, the black bear are gone. Uh, all those critters that we saw on that slide are, are gone. Uh, at this point, Columbus is our capital. It bounced around between Chillicothe, Marietta, and finally settled on Columbus. Great black swamp is gone. Mm -hmm. Three of these animals you probably know. The one in the top left is probably a little bit unfamiliar. It looks like a morning dove, but way more colorful than a morning dove. Let's start with the top right. What is that? Otter. What, what's the bottom right one? Here. <laughs> what's the bottom left? Turkey. Turkey. Guess what? In 1914, all four of them. Is on from Ohio. There was zero. But the top left one, in 1914, the last one on Earth died. Oh. It was a passenger pigeon. A, number, a bird that had numbers estimated at over 3 billion individuals in the 1700s. By 1914, was gone from the face of the earth. There are accounts of this bird during migration flying in flocks a mile wide and blocking out the sun overhead during the entire day mm -hmm. in one spot. Multiple spots where the flock went, but you could stand under these birds migrating all day long. Mm -hmm. They needed for it. They needed mature for it. for nesting. They especially needed it for migration during the fall. One of their favorite food supplies were beech nuts. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen a beech tree and known about beech trees, they're extremely slow growing. They routinely live 300 to 600 years. They're very thin bark. They're the ones that you're out in nature and you see bunch hundreds of names carved on them, like in the Rocky Hills, those are beach trees. Uh, they're almost easier to, to identify by their vandalism but, than by their reach. Beach trees, very good building wood, one of the best fuel wood, very high heat area, very easy to cut and process. They were cut down all along the eastern United States from day one of our settlement pretty much. So that bird disappeared. The white-tailed deer that now number every fall, nearly 700,000 in the state of Ohio, completely gone by 1914, as was the wild turkey in the river otter. So 1803, yay! 1903, not so much. Oh. And it loses the story for the last story. We come into the 20th century and we're seeing these effects, seeing animals go extinct, we're seeing animals disappear from the state. And it slowly kicks off an environmental movement. Uh, traditional wildlife, which is called something different, uh, was formed in the 1930s in Ohio to set seasons, to set limits, to fund uh, enforcement of wildlife law so that we didn't continue to lose them. And then in the 70s, we hit the prime of the environmental movement, mostly in response to environmental disasters like Love Canal in New York and a few other things um, with pollution. And it coincided with one of the most unpopular presidents in the United States history, Richard Nixon, was trying to get out of Vietnam, was embroiled in controversy. And for a long time in US politics, one of the ways to get points was to help save the environment. And he passed, he signed the Clean Air Act, he signed the Clean Water Act, which led to the formation of the EPA, which led to a lot of pollution restrictions on industry, and turned around a lot of environmental problems. 
I guess so that was in response to his political situation. It was in response to environmental disasters. The one I usually mention is the Cuyahoga River catching fire, uh, which happened at least five times in the 60s and 70s. It wasn't a one-time event. It happened multiple times. So some of you may have been around and seen these stamps. This, this stamp commemorates the first Earth Day, and it was issued in the 70s. I know when I was a kid, stamps cost 25 cents. So that might help you date me. This one costs it. <laughs> so we have a huge environmental movement start, and it's in general very bipartisan. It's not one side versus the other. Everyone is seeing the evidence of what's happening to the environment. You know, the Cuyahoga River catching fire <laughs> that affects anyone within a few miles of the river, if not more. Uh, you have a nice house built above a toxic waste dump, and all everyone you know in the neighborhood starts getting cancer. <laughs> it doesn't cancer doesn't care if you're Republican or Democrat, independent senator. Mm -hmm. Okay, the environment affects us all. So it's a very bipartisan issue, and a lot of stuff got done starting in the 70s. Uh, by 2003 in Ohio, we've gone from 17% forest up to about 31. Uh, and we'll we'll probably hang there for a long time. Because what is allowed to return to forest is areas that can't be grazed and they can't be rope on. Okay, the, the soil and the topography just does not support it. So a lot of these areas that were logged, they were settled. People tried to live there and raise crops or raise animals, and eventually it failed and they ended up going bankrupt. And it goes back to the state or the bank rather. And then the state's like, talks to the bank, but hey, there's you know, 40,000 acres here, let's turn it, turn it into Wayne National Forest or uh, Hawking State Forest or Bitten State Forest. Uh, you have companies like these paper companies buy up huge tracts of land and plant pine trees by hand for lead paper companies. So that's how a lot of this forest came back. Uh, up in Northwest Ohio, you have the oak openings uh, being reestablished. And it's not just the Toledo Metroplex. It's actually a corridor of a bunch of different agencies working together. At the southern end, you have Maumee State Forest. Then you have Oak Open. Then you have Irwin Nature Preserve. Uh, I'm sorry, Luke Campbell Nature Preserve. Then you have Kitty Todd Nature Preserve, which is the Nature Conservancy. Then you have more Metro Park property. And then you have Irwin State Nature Preserve. Then you have Tupor Metro Park. All connected. Six miles north and south, one mile wide. Once you get below Toledo Express Airport, head west for a mile and you head up open. And then south of that is Maumee State Forest. They're forming a corridor that someday might support bobcat, might support some blackfoot, probably not enough to ever support wolves. Okay, so that's the idea behind that corridor in Northwest Ohio. So these critters that we lost, they're all back now. First hunting season for deer uh, was in the 40s. Turkeys were reintroduced starting in the 70s. If you ever get the chance, go watch a YouTube video on capturing wild turkeys using something called a rocket net. It's fantastic. <laughs> they moved turkeys from Arkansas and Missouri, transplanted them here to Ohio. Were there bumps in the road? Yes. They tried to catch baby turkeys and bring them here and fed them until they're adults and they let them go. They're all bad. They have no idea what to do. They have to learn from their parents how to be wild turkeys. So then they started catching the adults and bringing them here. And they introduced them to Southeast Ohio. And as the population grew, then they started capturing Southeast Ohio turkeys and moving to other parts of the state. Wild turkey are now back in every county in the state. Uh, White-tailed deer naturally moved back in on their own from Kentucky, Michigan, Indiana, all of our border states. Black bear, first report to black bear in Ohio was about 2000, 2001. Um, today it's estimated that they are in about 33 of Ohio's 88 counties. And there's a total population around 100 to 125. Uh, we occasionally see one wander out of Michigan into Northwest Ohio. The last one was about eight years ago. It was killed on either Route 2 or Route 20 in Fulton County. Mm -hmm. I hit last time I saw it. 
uh, river otter were reintroduced in the northeast Ohio and the pretty rivers around Cleveland. Um, they have naturally spread on their own. They are now in the portage. They're in the Maumee. They are back in northwest Ohio. You can see river otter. You got to know where to look. All right. And we have some creatures that actually benefited from us clearing the swamp. So top left is your muskrat who loves our dishes. <laughs> Way more muskrat here than there were 200 years ago. The center picture, anyone know what that turner is? Coyotes. Coyotes are native west of the Mississippi River. <laughs> Anywhere east of the Mississippi River, they've moved in after the habitats were altered. They're supremely adaptable species, and they're filling a little bit of the role that wolves need. But not what the, not completely what the wolves need. Top right, mink. The mink is the predator of the muskrat. <laughs> it's amazing; they weigh about the same. <laughs> oh yeah, they'll eat chickens and ducks too. If you ever find dead chickens and ducks with the back of their head bit off, that's a mink. Maybe in your coop. Um, mink are one of the few animals on Earth that will kill things even when they're not hungry. They'll just leave them later. They, they hunt for fun. Our cottontail rabbits, they love our lawns to nest in. In the middle, the gray fox, which is an animal that actually declines. Because it is a fox of the forest. It's the only canine in North America that routinely climbs trees. Hmm. That's because their toenails are semi-retractable like a cat. So those guys climb trees. If you want to see them, usually have to be along a river in Northwest Ohio, either the Maumee or the Portage. Our friend the possum, the only marsupial in North America. Our garbage men, we clean up all the dead animals. You should thank the possum next time you see one. They also eat 99.9% .9 of all ticks that land on them. So on average, they're eating anywhere between two and 3,000 ticks a year. The fox squirrel is our Savannah style squirrel. It likes a mix of trees and open area. It's also our biggest tree squirrel in Ohio. Uh, I'm sure most of us have dealt with that too. Yeah. Ah, so I forgot where I'm going. The black squirrels are actually gray squirrels, which used to be the most common species of tree squirrel in Ohio. Gray squirrels like big forests. They do not like the open savanna type habitats that we create today with our lawns and trees. What happened in Bowling Green was there were gray squirrels living in and around Bowling Green and surrounded by prairie. But there were paths to woods. So squirrels could sort of migrate in and out over the years. Once all those prairies were farmed, and once the trees along the Maumee were sort of cut down the first time, you had an island of gray squirrels in Bowling Green. And there's an island in Haskins as well. And anytime you get an island effect on a mammal where no new genetics come in, you have weird things happen. And what happened in Bowling Green and Haskins is that a mutation for extra skin pigment, melanin, led to melanistic squirrels. Those are black squirrels. The opposite of albino is, or albinism. So melanism is the opposite of albinism. And on an island, recessive traits like that can become the dominant trait because there's no thinning out, there's no reintroduction of uh, the more common genes. So you end up with a lot of black squirrels in Haskins and Bowling Green, but they are in fact gray squirrels. So why was black? Most likely, it was an advantage in hiding. Um, there was less cover as the trees thin. Uh, so animals that hunted squirrels, uh, like Cooper hawks and red tailed hawks, if the squirrel's hiding in a canopy and it's black instead of gray, it blends in a little bit better. Uh, whereas if you're in a very thick forest, you ever walk through them, a lot of the tree trunks are gray. And a lot of the leaf litter on the ground, once it's been through winter, it's also gray. It loses all its color, tannin. 
So it's an advantage when you have thick forest to be dry. You blend in with the trunks, you blend in with the ground. So once you have green grass or ground, gray is not a great color for that. Yeah. So white squirrels, they do occur, but they deal with the opposite end of the problem. They stick out no matter where they are, unless there's snow on the ground. So they get in, they get eaten very quickly, and they don't get to pass their genetic time. <laughs> so it's sort of brutal. Uh, Mother Nature will correct for very strong abnormalities if they are not in advance. So being an albino, not an advantage, unless you live somewhere snow. Mm -hmm. um, and then the red fox in the bottom right, that's an animal that number has increased. It is a fox of open area. And I see him here in Bowling Green. Um, the one elementary school is over that way towards the hospital. Kanye. Kanye has red fox run through their soccer field pretty frequently. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thank you for listening. I know that was a long one. <laughs> that was great.